Welcome to Crash Course, a podcast about business, political, and social disruption, and what we can learn from it. I'm Tim O'Brien. Today's Crash Course, what happens when the lights go out? We all take for granted that nifty little miracle that happens when we flip a switch on our walls or lamps. The lights go on. Electricity is a modern marvel. It's the juice that fuels most of what people mean when they talk about civilization. Roads are illuminated. Kids can do their homework at night. Food gets preserved in the fridge. Computers boot up. Elevators move, etc., etc. Coal-fired power plants also have a major downside, pollution and environmental degradation. When we lose access to electricity, we feel the pain immediately. What we're used to doing collides with what we can suddenly not do. Millions of people in Texas lost power for days when the grid there seized in early 2021. Puerto Rico went through weeks and then months of rolling blackouts following devastating hurricanes several years ago. Now consider South Africa, the second largest economy on the African continent and home to 61 million people. The entire country has faced rolling blackouts for about 15 years. How can that be? And what does the present and future hold for a country that doesn't have a reliable source of electricity? I'm in South Africa, and joining me to discuss all of this is Paul Burkhart, an energy reporter with Bloomberg News in Cape Town, and Olga Konstantatos, a South African investor who has spent years watching the power crisis escalate in her country. Paul, let's start with you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So let's just start with a little background. For everybody out there who takes electricity for granted, but actually doesn't know how electricity is produced, give us a little primer about how the juice ends up in the wires. Sure. And I'll use the South African example. Basically, South Africa is very rich in coal. So they saw coal as really the optimal fuel. And what they do is they mine the coal, that goes straight into the power plant. They built the power plants right next to the coal mines, basically. So they have conveyors that end up running for miles as they mine more and more of the coal out. The coal, it's pulverized, and then it's burned in the boiler that heats up the steam, that powers the turbine, which powers the generator, and that turns into electricity. And then it goes through the transmission network. And in South Africa, the coal-rich area is far away from some of the other population centers. So the transmission lines run very far in some cases, yeah. And the electricity that goes through the wire then gets transformed and ends up in businesses or in people's homes. And in South Africa, in particular, all of that essentially runs around one company called ESCOM, or the Electricity Supply Commission. Tell me a little bit about ESCOM, this company that occupies a monumental and fundamental position in South African life. Mm. ESCOM is, well, it's 100 years old this year, and really it came about with the mines in South Africa, obviously needed power to extract the mineral resources here. So that was really the need for it. And then as it rose, it was basically a monopoly. It was a state-owned monopoly and later on really industrialized the country even through apartheid. And so South Africa needed to be self-sufficient in terms of electricity production, fuel production. And so ESCOM was one of the really the pillars, I guess, of how it achieved that. And it's sort of a trophy enterprise and state-owned, which meant it produced electricity pretty much at cost. So for South Africans who had access to that electricity, they were getting a really cheap way to electrify their homes and businesses. But you've also mentioned that it's a state-owned enterprise. And inevitably, companies that are state-owned their affairs and their business gets mingled with politics. And what has that meant for ESCOM? It complicates things quite a bit. And it's funny because if you, sometimes if you go to ESCOM and you ask about something, they say, oh, that's really a question for the government. And sometimes if you go to the the government shareholder, which is the ministry in charge of ESCOM is the Department of Public Enterprises. If you ask them things about ESCOM, sometimes they'll say, oh, that's an ESCOM board question, or that's really for the utility. We don't deal with that. But there is a very close relationship between the two. And I think 
that's been an issue for the leadership of ESCOM sometimes and how it runs the company because it really does need to do it in a way that's approved by government, ultimately. Another thing that's interesting to me about ESCOM's history is, you know, electricity is a precious resource. It powers a society. And when ESCOM first came into being, it only had to provide electricity to about 10% of the South African population. And then the businesses that population controlled, mining and and other businesses, which meant that 90% of South Africans, a significant portion of whom were black, had no access to electricity. And over the last century, as apartheid ended, as ESCOM evolved, as the South African economy evolved, one of the missions for ESCOM came to be providing electricity and power to 100% of the population. But from a company whose origins were only having to provide electricity to 10% of the population. So it had this mission to give everyone access to power, but had never really been built for that mission. Do you see that as almost like a deterministic or fated at birth kind of problem baked into it that because of apartheid, ESCOM wasn't built properly to fulfill the mission people are demanding of it today? Well, there are a couple of different parts to that. Certainly the domestic demand, I think, went up quite a bit. And then electricity is actually a right in South Africa. So that became very important. But on the other hand, the democratically elected government since 1994, there were some bumps in the road in terms of policy. And that includes building more capacity for ESCOM. And I think it was known that they were going to need more with supplying more power to residential areas, uh, and also just with economic growth for the country, they were going to need more power capacity. And there were a lot of stumbles there, and there were a lot of mishaps. And for example, two of the biggest power stations that ESCOM has built and still being finished, they were behind schedule, they've become over budget, they've been delayed by corruption, by labor strikes, just a number of different things that sometimes even have included bigger companies that we would recognize like ABB, McKinsey, that's all been part of some of the recent history. And so there were just a series of mishaps that didn't bring on the extra power when it was supposed to. And that's one of the reasons that ESCOM is in the situation it's in right now. You said an interesting thing a moment ago when you were explaining all this to me. You said that access to electricity is a right in South Africa. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Access to electricity was baked into the legal code. No one could be denied, in theory, or according to the law, access to electricity. Why did that get enshrined as such? Well, I think that in South Africa, especially after 94, obviously, South Africa has a very robust constitution. And in 94, for our readers, that's when Nelson Mandela comes to power, the great hero of both the pre- and post-apartheid eras, the man who sort of bridged Africa's troubled, sordid, grotesque past and some of the hopes of its future. That era was full of promise in 1994. And of course, ESCOM and electricity were part of a vision for hope and change. That's right. And then the party, the African National Congress that came to power, with the rise of the African National Congress, there was also the hope and the promise that things were going to change for everyone, that services were going to change for everyone, whether it's sanitation, transportation, and electricity. And so there's been quite an increase in electrification rates, like of the nation, but the process isn't done yet. But that was just seen as something that needed to be really in the quest for equality, especially now that there's a democratic government in place, that should be expected. And it's actually a right for people to have that. And I don't think anyone would disagree that a hallmark of a civilized society is that people have access to the power they need to improve their standard of living and increase their access to opportunities. The tricky thing when we look at the history of ESCOM is that that's all entwined with both human nature and human frailty, and the difficulty that any big complex company can pose to people managing it effectively, wherever the country is, whoever's running it, 
But over time in South Africa, ESCOM really became many things, a piggy bank for the people who controlled it, an influence machine, patronage for jobs, for people connected to the party in power, a source of hope if managed well. But we now know, given what's happened for over a decade here, that it is mismanaged and it is not modernizing and it's not fulfilling the promise of actually giving reliable energy generation to every South African. How did we get there? Why has ESCOM become this slow motion car crash? There are a few things that have proved to be troublesome for ESCOM and the government for that matter. And one is making decisions when they need to make them. So actually building the extra capacity, that was one issue and that was delayed. And then when it did happen, there was no EPC, basically a contractor that would oversee the other contractors. ESCOM wanted to do it itself as kind of a project that could show the world that it could build these massive power stations, the biggest in the world currently. And it just didn't go well. And there was also the graft was starting to show up at that point and labor issues and a number of other things. Certainly corruption is something that you could find even back in the apartheid era with some of the contracts there, how those operated. But it did get much worse in terms of just the scale of it on one hand. I want to take a break right there, Paul, hear from one of our sponsors, and we'll come back and continue this fascinating conversation. We're back with Paul Burkhart, a Bloomberg News reporter, and we're talking about South Africa's electricity nightmare. Paul, let's discuss what it means on a day-to-day basis when people don't have access to electricity. Businesses, homes, what are the ramifications of not having a reliable energy source, both for people themselves and for an economy? Yeah, for one thing, I got home yesterday and the lights went out, the load shedding started, which is what South Africans call these power cuts. They call it load shedding. Where does the term load shedding come from? That basically the company itself is finding ways to slough off some of the demands that are on it to generate electricity so the grid doesn't get overwhelmed, right? That's exactly it. It's designed to prevent a total collapse of the grid. So, you know, the frequency of the electricity can't drop to a certain level. So they want to cut off that demand from certain areas. And here they rotate it regionally. And it'll be in different stages. So each stage is 1,000 megawatts. So stage one, stage two, we've been at stage six quite a bit. They try to schedule it, but sometimes it comes up quickly. They can't always do that. And it really depends on the performance of the power stations. And because they're underperforming and they've become so unreliable, it happens quite often. And so yesterday when I came home and it was just about time to make dinner and the lights went off. So That's a very simple way. The traffic lights don't work. And then sometimes when the power comes back on again, they still don't work. So all the electronic items in your house and your appliances and the things that stay on normally, when they're turned on and off too much and they weren't designed to do that, eventually they're going to break a lot faster than if if it was just normal use. I noticed my laptop battery is really on the fritz now. So that's another example. But on a much more serious side of the scale, we've seen it start to creep into water supply and sewage treatment where the electricity goes off, the pumps don't work. If there's not a backup, then, you know, in terms of providing water supply, they can't get pumped up to the water, can't get pumped up to a higher lying area. But in terms of sewage, obviously, Here in Cape Town, they've closed some of the beaches in the last tourist season because there was raw sewage going into the water. So that's a problem and obviously very scary. And recently with some cholera outbreaks in the country, then the prospect of things getting worse, it's there. It's very close. And in terms of food production, too, I think it's also has been interesting when a slaughterhouse loses power, it can't slaughter food. So you get a backup of chickens or whatever. A backup of rotting chickens if they've been slaughtered. Yeah, and which you have to do something with at some point. And it just, the whole supply chain, even in the grocery store, the food on the shelves, sometimes there isn't as much of because all through the process, 
from the farm to the grocery store, the refrigeration, if the power goes out and there isn't a backup, then your food is not going to last as long. Then when it makes it into your refrigerator and the power goes out quite a bit, you know, you don't want to eat chicken that's been thawed a few times. So it really creates a lot of health issues too. And speaking of health issues, hospitals themselves rely on electricity generation in order to treat patients, to examine people, to house them safely when they're ill. So the hospital network gets threatened. And then what happens on dark streets? More crime. So those are issues as well. The crime rate has been rising in already crime-ridden neighborhoods around Cape Town and in other cities around South Africa. Are there any other ramifications that are front of mind for you when people are deprived of electricity? Certainly the prospect of social unrest is something that everyone is aware of because there are already demonstrations quite a bit in a lot of areas in South Africa where really any services haven't been delivered to a satisfactory degree. So people protest in the streets. And this would mean without power and without it for an extended period of time, that would create even more of that type of activity. But what you're seeing is even insurance policies have been rewritten to exclude periods of load shedding. And the prospect of that is also really scary because what are people going to do if they're not going to be able to claim insurance on things that are taken or destroyed or whatever happens when the lights do go out. So we're on the verge of something that could get much worse. Something that could get worse, much worse in terms of a failed state or just a mounting series of social problems that people are going to be challenged to deal with? Yeah, I think primarily just the obstacles that people have to deal with and just growing unrest, really. And the fact that if these power cuts deepen, even more. And, you know, there's room for them to before there would be a total collapse. It's just going to mean businesses are shut for longer. And especially in lower income areas like townships, they've found that two thirds of the businesses have had to lay people off because of load shedding specifically, because they just can't keep those businesses running. And so they're not able to make enough money. And we see a lot of that. So if you take everything together, then it's just it ruins business and it really makes it impossible kind of to get through the day. And I think eventually just that anger rises and doesn't turn into anything good. One avenue for turning that around would be just to effectively manage ESCOM itself, modernize the grid, get it ready for a new era, help with green energy transitions. But ESCOM has been sort of riddled at times with almost tragic comically crazy circumstances. You and I were talking recently together about one of the former CEOs claims he was poisoned. He was trying to clean, he says, has come up and get it on a new track. And he became the subject of threats. He eventually fled the country. He got the job after literally, I think, two dozen other people turned it down. In an environment like that, where corruption is rampant, where change is resisted to the point of threatening people with death or violence, it doesn't bode well for getting management into ESCOM that is capable and willing to turn things around. Yeah, it's difficult. I think some people who work at ESCOM feel like it's their patriotic duty. I think that's what keeps them going. So I think there are a lot of things to be hopeful about in terms of leadership and people wanting to do the right thing. And especially a lot of the workers within ESCOM, you know, there are 38,000 employees there. So surely most of them have to go to work, you know, believing that they're doing good for the country and that they want to turn this around. But obviously there's a search for a CEO right now, and it's hard to imagine who would want to take that job, but I'm sure they'll find someone and then they will have to face the same issues in terms of really their relationship with government and how they get things through. And there are so many different figures that participate in trying to fix the problem that that becomes a problem in and of itself sometimes. How do you think when you look down the road, how do you think this problem gets sorted? What is the solution? One positive thing that we're seeing is Certainly, there's encouragement now, even by ESCOM, which hadn't been, well, it was only in the recent past, really, that they were trying to bring in private companies to generate more power. ESCOM typically, and there's still a large faction in South Africa that would want ESCOM to survive as 
a behemoth and, you know, state-owned company. But there's certainly the door has opened really out of necessity to bring in more private production. So that will work. That's rising and that will work. It's just a matter of time. And the problem is that most of the population will remain disenfranchised by that. If ESCOM's prices are going up for electricity and private power is supplying private business or you're building it if you can or you're building it if you can afford it as a business or as a resident, it still leaves out the majority of the population that have to rely on ESCOM. So that's where the real variable is. And that's where they really need to come up with the solution and really get on the ball with a lot of initiatives that they've had in terms of building more renewables and just bringing in other power because the cost of blackouts is so great that in almost every case, it's going to be cheaper just to bring in even the most expensive power supply you can. And of course, businesses and more affluent residents have the option of getting their own generators or buying power from other resources. Low-income people don't have those options. So as you noted, it simply further deepens these income and social chasms that divide the population. You know, Paul, I always like to ask people during the show, what have they learned from a collision that we're talking about? What do you know now about either the value of electricity or the importance of ESCOM in South African society that you didn't know those many, many years ago before you started covering energy and ESCOM so closely? Well, what's kind of funny is you could probably ask just about anyone on the street. We could walk out of this building and ask just about anybody about ESCOM, and they'd be able to tell you all about capacity, energy availability factor, a lot of technical things. Everyone in this country knows what's happening with the power system. So everyone here has learned a lot. And I've certainly learned just some of the technical things about Transmission grids, for example, in bringing in more renewable energy, one of the issues that South Africa has faced is they don't have enough room on the grid in the most optimal parts for sun and wind. And so that filled up. And you see these issues coming up in other countries, in Western countries, but you see them here first. So if you want to look at a place where the extreme's been reached, then you can look at this model. And so I think I've realized just a lot of the shortcomings of, you know, even if you're looking at clean energy, which is really positive development, it has its limits that you have to admit and that you only build so fast or you can only, you know, use during certain periods. And the reality of that, I think, comes up here quite a bit. Paul, we're going to take a break, and then I'm going to bring another guest aboard to talk about ESCOM and South Africa's power problem. But thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much. It was great. We're back, and we're joined by Olga Konstantatos, an investor with Future Growth Asset Management in Cape Town. Olga, we've been talking about South Africa's years-long struggle to provide its residents and businesses with electricity, And I wanted you to join us for two reasons. One, you're the go-to person when people try to divine the future of South Africa's power company, ESCOM. And two, you have skin in the game. Your firm owns a big chunk of the company's debt. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. You know, I'm fascinated by ESCOM because it's not just a company story or even the story of one country's struggle to provide electricity. It's about economic development and how states and businesses improve everyone's standard of living. And that's really not happening right now in South Africa, is it? Well, no. The rolling blackouts that you mentioned at the beginning since 2007, and it's been on and off, it hasn't been a permanent feature, have really impacted citizens' lives, have impacted businesses, have impacted economic growth in our country. And certainly the escalation of load shedding in more recent history has very negatively impacted our future, our outlook, and really everything about the economy. ESCOM's problems are intertwined with the country's problems. And so solving ESCOM really puts us on a much more sustainable path to economic growth and prosperity, which we as a country desperately need. And is that a problem in your mind that's Is there a solution available to the problem the country faces when its single, its only electricity generator 
is so deeply troubled? I think, yes, the solution to ESCOM's problems doesn't lie with one particular intervention or one particular solution. Solutions are multifaceted. The problems are multifaceted. So ESCOM's problems didn't start last week or last year. They started a good few years ago. And so the solutions to ESCOM lie in cost-reflective tariffs. They lie in addressing its unsustainable debt burden that it holds. It lies in fixing the very high and unsustainable cost base and addressing some of the corruption, maladministration, malfeasance, misspending, all of that. So, so far you've given me four things and they all sound huge, right? So when you talk about tariffs, for the outside listener, you're talking about price increases to users, right? Exactly. That's correct. Have there been massive price increases passed along to businesses and and residents in the country for years? So they have. The rate of increase of ESCOM's tariffs have increased beyond what inflation has increased. I think the problem with ESCOM is that it's in a classic utility death spiral. So the tariffs, even though they have been increasing, are not enough to cover its very high cost base. So the tariffs are one part of the equation, but addressing the very high cost base also needs to happen, and that hasn't happened. You said the scary term death spiral. Do you think of that as a financial death spiral? In in other words, the company is saddled with so much debt, and the coupons it's paying out on that debt relative to the amount of revenue it's bringing in, and there are no easily replenishable or other sources of revenue that can make up for that debt burden that it's saddled with. Is that why you, when you use the term death spiral, is that what you're referring to? So there's a death spiral at ESCOM, the utility death spiral and a debt spiral. So let's unpack it. The utility death spiral is what you talk about where the revenues are increasing. It then means that users then decide they want to go for less expensive alternatives. So they then remove themselves from the grid or they reduce their consumption from ESCOM. So as the tariffs go up, so more people are departing from ESCOM, making you know other alternatives. And that means then that you need to recover your costs from a smaller user base, which means higher and higher tariffs. And it becomes the spiral as the tariffs get even higher, then more people then, those that can find alternatives, you then have to recover the cost base, you know, from a smaller pool each time. That's the utility death spiral. The debt spiral is similar but different in that ESCOM isn't generating enough cash flow to service its debt. And so the capital structure of ESCOM is just not fit for purpose. And so it is unable to service its debt, meet its debt obligations without significant intervention from its shareholder. That's the debt spiral. So it's the two together. And I have to think to myself, what's a nice woman like you doing in a place like this? Because (laughs) you own some of that debt and you're shrewd, you're smart, you're informed, you're experienced, you've been around the block and you're hanging in there as a debt holder. And as someone who's much less sophisticated than you are about these things, and I don't know the history of the company as well as you do, I'm not familiar with the management and I'm sure you're steeped in an understanding of the management there. Why are you hanging in? Tell me about how your firm first became an investor in ESCOM and why you've sort of hung in there over the years. I think it's important to remember that from a South African debt perspective, the overwhelming majority actually of ESCOM's debt is government guaranteed. And so what that means is that ESCOM takes on the debt, but there's a government backstop. So to the extent ESCOM is unable to pay on a scheduled coupon or principal date, the government will step in and meet that payment. So the credit risk of ESCOM is a little bit, I don't want to use the word less important, but it's standalone credit is very weak, absolutely, but it is buttressed by a government guarantee. And so the bulk of the South African debt or the issues in South African RAND is government guarantee. And so investors... There's a lens that one can look at ESCOM as being almost a department of government. So instead of buying government bonds, you then buy an ESCOM bond, which comes at a significant yield enhancement relative to a government bond. It's almost a chicken and an egg thing, right? Because ESCOM can't thrive without economic growth and the economy can't thrive unless ESCOM is thriving. Okay, so if there is this what's the word, sort of the yin and yang relationship between the economy and ESCOM? They both need one another, essentially. And the problems facing ESCOM are both its own financial management, its corporate management, and then the nature of the beast itself. It needs to modernize. Mm -hmm. It has outdated power plants. It's taking some plants offline. 
Uh, the company is trying to break itself up, or I guess it already is broken up now into three different parts, generation, transmission, and distribution. How do you see a good manager of SCOM making SCOM a more thriving and vital company than it is right now? Wow. How long do you have? <laughs> Get going. But think if you could wave your magic wand across SCOM and everything would change tomorrow. What would it look like tomorrow compared to what it looks like today? So I think when you look at this, you can look at it at two levels. One is what can ESCOM itself and management at ESCOM do? And two, what must the shareholder be doing? Because some of the actions that are needed are arguably not in ESCOM's domain. So let me break that down for you. You spoke earlier about ESCOM being separated into generation, transmission, and distribution. Generation is where the power gets made, the coal-fired plants currently ESCOM's overwhelming fleet at the moment is coal-fired plants. One of the purposes of deregulating and splitting ESCOM up into three is to open up the generation market and to allow for other people, not necessarily ESCOM, to produce the power. And that's actually the government policy that has been rather successful, arguably could have been more successful. And what I'm talking about here is the Renewable Energy Independent Power Program, where government asked for solar and wind and other renewable energy source producers to put up wind farms and solar farms and ESCOM would buy or does buy that energy from those power producers and that energy gets fed into the grid. But let me interrupt you for a minute on that point. One of the hurdles there, however, is that solar and wind will only provide a small portion of the country's energy needs right now. We're talking maybe a decade or more from now where that actually becomes a meaningful replacement from electricity that is generated by coal-fired plants. Is that correct or correct me if I'm wrong? Well, I think it depends the pace at which one executes on the renewable energy program. So if we go back, the renewable energy program really started in about 2011, 2012. So it's been 10 years in the making. And the way the plan was meant to work, there were arguably meant to have been very many more megawatts added to the grid than have currently been added. So currently there have been 6,000 megawatts of new energy added to the grid from the renewable energy sources. That could have been a lot more had the program been accelerated, had it not been deliberately, we think, stalled in the kind of height of state capture years, the 2015, 2016 years. And so, yes, it is currently a small portion, but it could be a very big portion. We've got abundant solar resources. We've got abundant wind resources. And if you place them in the right places over the country, they can become a significant source of power. At the moment, the hurdle to that is the transmission grid. So in theory, one could add infinite amounts of solar and wind energy, but the practical roadblock one's going to come up against is actually plugging, I kind of think of it as plugging, plugging that into the grid so those electrons can move you know, to my home and yours. And, um, and when we talk about transmission, we're essentially talking about wires, yeah. wires from the generators to transformers and then into people's homes. Yeah. So I guess the fact that the organization and implementation of the transmission plan just sitting on the minister's desk suggests that the minister doesn't care if people's food is rotting in their fridge or that the kids can't do their homework at night. Why isn't there a greater sense of urgency on the part of the government to address this foundational and substantial problem? I, mean, I can't speak for the minister. I think that the points that are made from the government side is that they are addressing it with urgency. They've established multiple task forces and teams, and there's various interventions at an interministerial level that are looking at this problem. And so there is a plan. There's a plan that was released in July last year, which is to address the electricity. So there is arguably a plan. I think the question comes into... Are the interventions enough? Is the timing of the intervention urgent enough? So from your perspective, they are moving with some alacrity around this. It's not just stuck in the bureaucracy and it's not just people passing it down the line and not getting the job done. There are meaningful steps being taken to sort this out? Yes and no. I think there are meaningful steps. I think the urgency of the crisis is finally being highlighted. I think what's Concerning, I guess, for us is that the alarm bell has been rung on ESCOM for quite some years now. So we knew way back in the mid-2000s that we would run out of generation capacity. Not a lot was expedited to address that problem. We've known for quite some time that ESCOM's debt was at an unsustainable level. That's only been started to address as of February with the finance minister's announcement in the budget of the debt relief this year. 
you know, we've known about the need for unbundling. In fact, unbundling has been part of, I think, ESCOM's white paper as far back as the late 90s to unbundle ESCOM. It's been part of the plan. But the action is kind of happening at the, you know, really when the emergency becomes very dire. And so I guess the question that we would have is, in terms of the forward-looking view and what needs to be done, crisis management and applying the right attention and speed to decisions in a crisis, yes, that is important. But what is also important is the looking forward and being able to plan to avert a crisis so that we can take steps today and tomorrow and this year and next year. And using the transmission grid as an example, we know that we need investment in the transmission grid. We know these projects take a long time. Anyway, they take between seven to 10 years to get them up and going. So let's start now with that and let's not wait for a crisis. I think that's the challenge that we find is that crisis management sometimes doesn't lead to optimal outcomes. And it can, um, what am I trying to say here? You're trying to say that sometimes it takes (laughs) COVID-19 for people to make good public health decisions that they've been putting off for a long time. And then they wait till the crisis arrives before they take measures they might have taken years before. And perhaps you're saying right now that South Africa has an existential power generation crisis, and maybe it's taking a crisis to force both the government and the private sector to take the steps needed to resolve the problem? Yes, I think that's right. I think also the nature of the crisis and the length of time it's taken us to get here, the interventions need to be so much greater, and they need to be done with utmost speed and precision. And I think part of the challenge also is there can be a tendency to wait for the perfect plan and to formulate the perfect plan. And perhaps what might be needed is a little bit more nimbleness in adapting to a plan and to start executing and adapting as circumstances change. So it might be that you try one thing, but it doesn't necessarily work. You can tweak it here or there. Much better to do that. At least there's some forward momentum that creates energy of its own accord, upon the pun. But yeah, so I think a certain level of nimbleness and adaptability is also probably needed. What we've been very good at, I think, is diagnosing the problem, identifying the problem, solving for the problem in a plan, on a document, on a PowerPoint, at presentations, etc. Where we've been less adaptable, I guess, is in the execution of the plan and in really sometimes making some of the hard trade-offs that are needed in executing a plan. We're never going to make everybody happy all of the time. And I think that's maybe the benefit of a crisis is it does focus one's attention very laser-like on the immediate problem, which is the lack of generation capacity that we have right now and solving load shedding, which is going to take years. It's not a tomorrow solution. You're hanging in there as a debt holder. You're not abandoning ship. What are you optimistic about and what are you pessimistic about when you look at the landscape right now? So I guess, look, I'm a bond investor. <laughs> and so we live we live in the world of fear, not in the world of hope. So I'm much better at answering what I'm pessimistic about than what I'm hopeful about. But let me try. So I think, I think what we're seeing now is the elevation of the crisis. It is receiving attention at the very highest levels. That is a good thing. And I think the link, I guess, between ESCOM's, the solving of ESCOM's problems and the solving our economic growth problems, that is very clear. We've seen it in the numbers. And so that is providing a level of clarity, I think, to some of the decisions that are being made. And so I think that's all very good. I'm also very encouraged by, and it comes out in different forums, but certainly the increasing tilt to renewables, our move to cleaner energy, you know, our just energy transition. These things are all important for us to manage as an economy. Actually, as a planet, we need to do this. ESCOM is one of the biggest emitters. And so the tilt to renewables, the tilt to cleaner forms of energy is something I'm personally and certainly Future Growth is very encouraging of and very optimistic about. It is actually the solution to our energy problems. So all of that, very optimistic about. I guess where I get pessimistic is in the lack of the hard decisions that are needed to be made. And I think where I get pessimistic is in the magnitude of the problem. And so while it may have been, and one you know can't look back, one must look forward, might have been fewer interventions a few years ago, the magnitude of those interventions are so much bigger now. And I think the challenge lies a lot in who actually is responsible for delivering on the solutions. What we're not always clear on is what are the priorities? Does everybody agree on the priorities and on the implementation of those priorities? I think we can get a little bit muddled. One department might have particular priorities that might not necessarily be shared by another department. It sounds like South Africa needs an energy czar. 
given the real authority to implement radical, speedy, and thoughtful decisions. Well, arguably, that's the purpose of the new electricity minister that was appointed by the president a few months ago. And again, it's a part solution. His powers were only determined a week ago, I think. And so given the urgency of the crisis, this was announced in February, if I recall. And so two or three months have gone by without the minister himself actually knowing what his powers are to be. And so I think that's the challenge is that we know what needs to be done. We kind of put a little plaster on it and wait a few months and then put another little plaster on it and then wait a few months. And that's not really a way to address a crisis. We don't let people escape the show, Olga, without sharing what they've learned. Crash Course is about learning moments. So you have been watching ESCOM for years. You've been watching this problem for years. What do you know now that you didn't know when you first began overseeing your investments in ESCOM? That's a very interesting question, Tim. So I think what is reinforced, I guess, for us, certainly as investors, is that non-financial risk factors, so the ESG, environmental, social and governance risk factors, are becoming buzzwords now, but they actually translate into very real financial impact and financial loss. And so you don't see it immediately. And certainly in 2016, ESCOM's financial state was not great, but it definitely wasn't what it is now, which is way worse. And so I think that the real lesson has been that not paying attention to those non-financial factors. And the environment is another one, by the way, the environmental costs. And ESCOM has a big role to play in solving that for us as a country as well. Not paying attention to those non-financial risks do actually translate into hard income statement, balance sheet and cash flow impact, negative impact over time. And so I think the lesson certainly from an investment point of view is that, yes, numbers must stack up. But if you're going to be taking, and that is what we are asked to do, is to take a forward-looking view on a company, in this case, ESCOM, one has to factor in those elements. And particularly on the governance side is to look at, well, how's the company being run? Are the right people in place? Are they making the right decisions in the best interest of the company? How's internal control framework stacking up? How is risk being managed within the entity? You know, all these seemingly boring questions, but actually have real financial impact that outlive, I guess, political cycles, outlive management contracts, outlive boards tenure. And so there is very much a need to focus on that if we are going to be investing sustainably into the future with all the risks that we are facing. Olga, we've run out of time. I wish I had more time with you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tim. And thank you very much for having me on the show. Olga Constantatos is the head of credit at Future Growth Asset Management. You can find her on Twitter at OLGSO502. Paul Burkhart, who also joined us today, is a reporter with Bloomberg News. You can read his work on Bloomberg's website, the Bloomberg Terminal, and on Twitter at P. Burkhart. Here at Crash Course, we believe that collisions can be messy, impressive, challenging, surprising, and always instructive. In today's Crash Course, I learned that all of the horrors facing South Africa because it doesn't have reliable electricity generation may be visited on other countries as well that don't pay attention to how South Africa got here. What did you learn? We'd love to hear from you. You can tweet at the Bloomberg Opinion handle, at Opinion, or me, at Tim O'Brien, using the hashtag Bloomberg Crash Course. You can also subscribe to our show wherever you're listening right now and leave us a review. It helps more people find the show. This episode was produced by the indispensable Anna Mazarakis, Moses Andam, and me. Our supervising producer is Magnus Henriksen, and we had editing help from Sage Bauman, Katie Boyce, Jeff Grocott, Mike Nietzsche, and Christine Vanden Bylart. Blake Maples does our sound engineering, and our original theme song was composed by Luis Guerra. I'm Tim O'Brien. We'll be back next week with another Crash Course. Crash Course.